So the presentation is actually going to be in English. Um, uh, I'm actually very happy that we have the live translation. All right, so yeah, let's get started. I just need to make sure that I don't move away from this. So I mean, uh, one thing you're not, you got to know about me is I'm Venezuelan, but I'm also half Italian, and I need to move my hands to talk. And it's going to be really hard to just like stand still here and like make sure that everyone can actually listen to me and not, like, not hit the microphone with my hands. Um, all right, so inheriting code. And, um, and I don't mean classes. So most of the time when we talk about inheriting code, people are talking about like inheriting classes and, and having like object-oriented kind of programming. Um, in this case though, we're talking about getting code that is not yours. And I don't specifically talk about like legacy code, like you go to a company and like there's like very old code that just runs on like a very old IBM machine and it's all written in assembly, no. Um, we're talking about just getting code and adopting code that is not yours. Uh, it can be legacy code, of course, but it can also be like a random open source project that you just want to contribute to. Um, before that, that's me, just in case it wasn't obvious. Um, that's, that's my full name. I said I am half Italian, but my name is fully Italian. Um, uh, that's Flapberry7, that's me on Twitter and every social media out there. Um, if you like the presentation, I like feedback, I love feedback. If you like the presentation, by all means, uh, go tweet me. Um, put it on Twitter, someone has to feed my ego, so just go and do it. Um, if you don't like the presentation, I was never here. That is not me. Don't even follow me on Twitter, I'm just kidding. Just let me know. Um, this is all about uh, getting feedback from you and like improving the content of the presentation and making sure that other people can actually benefit from it as well. I work at Elastic. Um, I've been at Elastic for five months. Uh, before Elastic, I worked at Red Hat for seven years. Um, it's been a it's been a quite interesting ride so far. So if you if you want to know more about that, just let me know. Um, and yeah, if you just want to chat, DMs are open. Just ping me. It's totally fine. Uh, so wait, why English? Like why English if you speak Spanish? Because the presentation when I created it was in English, and I'm too lazy to actually translate it in my head live. And since we have a live translation, we should we actually we should all like give a warm applause and clap to the live translation because they've been doing an amazing job. And especially because thanks to them, I don't have to translate the presentation. Um, and again, I'm Italian, I'm lazy, so I don't want to do that. Um, inherent is tough. Um, and from someone I hated you. And why from someone I hated you? Like it, when I was working on this presentation, I was thinking like, how can I explain the whole process of inherent code? And when you go there and you get some code and like, you know everything is fantastic. So when you go to an open source project from someone that actually knows how to do open source, um, and, and then you go to the project and everything is great, like there are tests, there are docu there's documentation, like the, the code is well written, uh, there are comments on it, and everything is fantastic. Now, that is the best case scenario, and if you find a project like that, stick to it, because they're rare, uh, but also, um, it's, it's boring to explain in a presentation. So the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna get an example from a project, like I'm not actually gonna point at a project because that would be mean, but um, we're gonna use a, a bad scenario, kind of like the worst case scenario as an example on how to build this process. Now many things that we're gonna, like that I wanna present, present today are in isolation, they're kind of obvious, like if you think about them when, when you're back home and you're like, oh, okay, come on, like this guy just stated the obvious like for an entire hour and I just wasted an entire hour of my life. Um, it's true, what I'm presenting here is kind of like a process that you could follow uh, to kind of like adopt some code and, and make it yours. All right, I'll shut up and get to the content. Um, all right, the sad story. The sad story is that there is no documentation, right? You get to a project and, and well, the project doesn't have any documentation, doesn't have any tests. Uh, the guy just like wrote code and run it in production, no tests, there's no need to test, he trusts himself or herself way too much. Um, the code is written, uh, is written poorly, so, so the poorly part is, is very subjective. Uh, it might look beautiful to whomever wrote the code, but it might just like be completely shitty to you. Um, and the use cases are unclear. This is probably one of the um, most underrated, uh, let's say, things that people should take under consideration when writing um, software is understanding the actual use cases and who is supposed to be using and how your software is supposed to be used. Um, so the use cases are completely unclear and the deadlines are of course around the corner. Like, so the deadlines, if you're working on an open source project are like 
I don't want to say they're not important, but like they're less important. If you are, a, if you join a company as a contractor, uh, they're probably extremely important. Like as soon as you join, like before they tell you what you got to do, they're going to tell you like it has to be done in two weeks. Um, so deadlines are right around the corner. So that is the worst case scenario. If you can think about other things that I should add there, just let me know. But that sounds like pretty scary. Um, all right, first step, understand the what, the how, and finally the why, and not judging. So the not judging part is you got to be able to do all these things without judging the actual source code. And it's really hard because we tend to be, as developers, we tend to be really judgy when we see someone else's code. Um, but especially when you're trying to understand the how, um, you got to be able to to go through understanding how things were done without kind of like judging why they were done that way. Because then you have to understand the why as well without judging uh, how the person did it. But anyway, first of all, you got to understand what the use cases are. You got to understand why the person um, actually created that software, what the software is supposed to do, what, is, what problems it is supposed to solve. And if those are not clear, try to clarify those, of course. Um, what is the adoption? How many people are using this software? Why is this important? Like, it is important because whenever you're modifying a code, you're, you're, we're talking about getting some code that is not yours and that you, of course, have to uh, modify somehow. So if you get some code that is not yours and you got to do some changes to it, you got to understand what impact those changes are going to have, not only in a feature or like in a very like implementation kind of thing, but you have to know the impact that it's going to have on the users. Now, if the software has a million users, you know that if you break it, you're going to break a million users. If the software has five users, well, you know you're going to break five users. Now, the fact that five users only, like, the fact that your software only has five users doesn't mean that, isn't, like, that you can just go and break them. It just, what it, what it means is that the impact is, is you know, more like under control or controllable to, to some extent. Um, what is the plant work? Uh, there are many, there are often the, the needs of the software, the software uh, diverge from what is actually planned. So if you if you join a company as a contractor, then you like someone will tell you, you know, you know this is what you got to do, and then um, you go to the team that is actually building the software, and they're and they're like, well, this is all that is planned actually, because to do that we got to do all these other things. So you got to understand all that, and and you also have to understand what has been done already. So there's a there's a use case, there's a plan. You wanna you you want to get somewhere, you have some goals, and to get to those some. To those goals, you got to fix some, a bunch of other things, right? So what has been done already? Uh, how far along the line we are? Um, all those things you got to understand. Then you start understanding how, how the software was implemented. Uh, how were things done? And especially how the software has re uh, was written. And you got to do that without, like, without judging the why, without, without actually going through, you know, like why this guy wrote this thing this way. And the reason is because when we, when we start understanding the why, and understanding the why is extremely important. Because sometimes people are forced to do things even though they're not entirely, like, even though they don't entirely agree with the, with the way they're done. Like, you understand why, uh, you know, for example, why, why the software doesn't have tests. Is it because the guy that actually wrote the software, like, doesn't like tests? Or is it because the company put him, like, or her in a really bad position where, you know, tests just couldn't be written? Or like there's no you know, money for infrastructure. I don't know. Like I'm just coming up with random excuses. But there, there might be reasons behind why things were done the way they were done that are not necessarily completely related to the guy or the person that wrote it, but uh, they might be related to the company and the culture of the company, right? Why there's no documentation? Is that the company doesn't believe in documentation? Is that the company doesn't think it is a good investment to have people actually writing documentation? Or is it because the guy just doesn't like to write documentation? So all these things are important. And the reason it is important, the other reason it is important to understand the why is because every software has history. So many times you find software that is currently in production that it was first written as a normal script that ran in someone's laptop. And he was like, well, I needed to do this really fast. I wrote this script. And then someone found my script and thought it was an amazing idea. And then that script was put in production. And then you know, we ended up with a script that doesn't have test, documentation, or anything. It's not written for production, but it's running in production. So all these things are. And it's, it's not necessarily about, all right, it's a horrible thing, but it's not necessarily a bad thing in the sense that it is solving a problem, right? It's just like the technical debt when they put it in production is just massive already. It's not that it was growing like slowly and incrementally and in a way that you can actually control it. Uh, but all these things are important because they teach you a lot, they tell you a lot about the culture of the company 
and about the history of the software itself, which is important to understand before you start messing with it. Um, and yeah, well, this is a quote that um, I, I think is important. So a mature developer seeks, the, uh, seeks for the why before judging the how. Right, so you gotta you gotta understand why things exist the way they exist before you you start judging how people actually did things. Because once you know why there's no documentation for software, or once you know why there's no uh, there are no tests for the software, you can also understand who's to judge if there's anyone to judge, and and what to do next. Basically, what is the next step that you want to take as a developer to kind of like adopt this software and make it better and make it yours. Second step is familiarize yourself with the environment, the user base, and ev evaluate a read write. So I'm very careful whenever I talk about read writes because as developers, we always like to read write everything because we think our stuff is gonna be better than others. Um, but there are some rules that I think we should all, like there are some questions, not really rules, that we should all ask ourselves. So we'll get there. So learn how to use, um, how users are consuming your software. So we talked about use cases a little bit. When you, when you have a product, your product has some use cases that someone, some, or hopefully some pro project manager or someone playing the role of a project manager um, come up with. And then you have all these use cases that you're trying to cover. But then the fact that the software was written to, to do a specific thing doesn't mean that the users are actually using it for that, right? Oftentimes you have a software that was meant to, I don't know, provide networking and it turns out that some user found that there's a way for that software to also provide storage, and they just started using it to you know, get some storage. Um, now, the reason you gotta understand that is that whenever you're doing changes to the software, if you don't know how your users are actually using your software, you might break them, right? Because you think the software was meant to just like provide networking, and then you find out that it is providing storage, and then you just like remove that capability, and then all the users that, ended, like, that were using your software to provide storage um, are gonna be completely out of the um, loop. So learn how your users are using the software, and a good way to do this is by running the software yourself. Try it, test it, uh, run it, and let it fail. Let it fail many times, because when you run the software and you let it fail, you, you're gonna understand you know, what the flaws of the software are. One thing, for example, is like if you, if you download whatever package for whatever source and you run your software and it fails at start, it probably means that it doesn't have good defaults. It doesn't have any sane defaults. You want your software to have sane defaults. You want to be able to just like download the binary or whatever it is that you're delivering, run it, and have it run. And you want those default values in all your configurations to be sane in the sense that they provide a good enough environment for people to use your software. It might not be good to, for like massive scale deployments kind of thing, but it's good enough for like get anyone started in using your software. If you run the software and before running the software you need to like set a gazillion of different config options, then it doesn't have good defaults and it's a annoying, I was gonna say pain, yes, but whatever. It's really annoying uh, to, to consume your software. So run it, let it fail, see how it fails, Making your software fail, making the software that you're adopting fail, is gonna teach you a lot about your software. It's gonna teach you, you know, a lot about the defaults and the config options. It's gonna teach you about how you can run it, the different ways that it can fail, the different exceptions, the different errors, and like a bunch of other things. It's gonna teach you a lot, probably way more than going through the documentation, to be honest. And at least I, as a developer, I love running the software and like putting my hands on stuff. That's how I learned faster. Um, so I could read the documentation, but I, I'm pretty sure that if I run the thing, I'm gonna understand it way better than by just reading the documentation. So since you're the one adopting it and the one that has to modify the code eventually, I would recommend you to, uh, to try to run it and use it before, before you do any changes. And so far, like again, like so far we haven't changed anything, like not a single line of code, right? And it's hard because we see the software and we don't like it and we wanna make it better. Uh, but you, you gotta be strong here. Um, and then you read the documentation. Read the code and read everything there is to read. Uh, sometimes there's a lot to read, sometimes there's not so much to read. Um, hopefully there is enough to read to actually understand things, right? Uh, take your time, take your time to do to, to your research on whatever it is that you're adopting because once you know very well what you're adopting or like well enough, then you know what you're setting yourself up to, for. Um, so. Take your time, resist the temptation of uh, modifying the code. But now, once you've done all that, you kind of have to evaluate whether you want to rewrite the thing or not, 
Um, so we're, again, like I said before, we, we're, we tend to think that whatever we write is, what, is better than whatever we have in our hands. Uh, so we, we love rewriting everything, especially if it is given to us in a language that is not the one that we love. Uh, so before rewriting the software or deciding to do it, um, ask, yourself, ask, ask yourself a couple of questions. Um, or not a couple, like five questions at least. Um, so the first one is, is, are you familiar with the language and the ecosystem, right? If someone comes to you and gives you a bunch of like Ruby code and, and says like, well, you gotta modify the software, um, ask yourself you know, how familiar you are with the language and how familiar you are with, with the entire ecosystem. If the answer is absolutely like nothing, like I have no clue what's happening here, that's a good sign that you might want to rewrite it or just not sign up for the job, right? Um, then like, would I rewrite be faster? Like, would I be, you know, rewriting the whole thing, would, would it be faster than me trying to learn? Like, m think that someone gives you some Ruby and like you're not entirely familiar with it, like you know a little bit and you know a little bit of the environment, but to do whatever they're ask you, they've asked you to do, like you, do, you still have to like do research and learn a lot of things, right? You know, is it faster for you to just like rewrite it in Python uh, than learning everything that you have to learn and do it in Ruby? Um, answer that question. Um, would I write make it easier to maintain? This is, uh, this is probably my favorite question of them all, right? Um, sometimes we have software that is not only like poorly written to our taste or something like that, but it's also like really hard to maintain. Like they're not good defaults and whenever you run it, you have to put like a three or four supervisors that keep an eye on it to make sure that it doesn't fail and if it fails, like, it just comes back up. Uh, there's data corruption kind of thing and all those things, right? So. If, if you have this software that is really hard to maintain, it's, it's causing a lot of, it's increasing the cost of operations for you, um, then you gotta kind of like do research and analyze whether doing a read write and making it easier to maintain and more, and like more stable uh, would, it, would be better for you in the long run. And you always have to think in the long run because like as a, as a one that is adopting this code, I, well, I assume that you just don't want to get it, modify it, and then get the fuck out and never show up again, right? You're gonna want to maintain it and you're gonna want to see it grow and, and make it better for the company um, and to make it feel better, I guess, but. So would I rewrite have side effects on other users? Remember that when we said like, you gotta know your user base, like how many people are using it. If you change from, I don't know, from Ruby to Python and everyone has all their environments configured to deploy this Ruby application, that means that they'll have to rebuild their environments because now it is Python out of the blue. So is that gonna be like a real pain for all your users and for all the environments running your software? You should answer that question. Like, and, and then, like there's not actual numbers. I'm not gonna tell you, see, if it is 95% yes, then you should rewrite it. No, like you, you have to be objective here, as objective as possible. We're talking about time, money, and effort. So you, you have to think about you know, which one is more important to you and which one is gonna make your business or your like, career uh, grow better, I guess. Um, will other members of the team be able to contribute? So if someone gives you Ruby and then you rewrite it in Python and the rest of the team only knows Ruby and you're the only Python person, you probably should have learned Ruby. Uh, because then you're the only one that's gonna maintain that code. Like everyone is just gonna look at you. For every bug, they're just gonna assign it to you and you're the responsible for everything. And you don't wanna be that guy. Um, so think about the team that is gonna work for you. And also like if you don't have a team, think about the future team that might be working for you, right? So if I, if I pick like a random obscure language and I ended up like, I don't know, writing everything in assembly, uh, you know, like how many people are actually gonna show up in, like, in my CV and like my, my job posting saying that, yeah, I'm a, you know, I've been doing assembly for like a gazillion of years and I can help you and like, no, no one. So think about that. You, wanna, you want to think about the team around you and if you don't have a team, like the team that is gonna come eventually in the future. Uh, third step, build your guarantees first and then refactor or implement everything else. Uh, so if there are guidelines, write them. You wanna build your guarantees. So what's building your guarantees? Before you rewrite or you modify your code, you wanna have like a source of truth. You wanna have guarantees. Things that say, whatever you're gonna do next, they have to respect these guarantees. They have to respect these guidelines. If there are no tests, most of the time for software, the tests are the source of truth. The tests are your actual guarantees. If you modify something and they break the test, then you broke something, right? So build your guarantees. Make sure there are enough guarantees for you uh, so that you can feel comfortable modifying the software that you're modifying, right? So if there are no guidelines, write them. Um, and by guidelines, I mean, you know, 
coding styles, uh, the way you write documentation, the way you write tests. Um, sometimes we don't pay a lot, of, a lot of attention to these things, but then it pays off, especially when doing reviews and when like more people join the team. If you have these guidelines, it just makes it easier for everyone to know, you know what kind of guidelines they have to follow. If there are no guidelines, people are going to write software the way they want to write it and the way they think is, is prettier, I guess. And then you're going to spend a lot of time in reviews saying like, yeah, but you should break this line. And like, yeah, don't use parentheses and whatever. Like, if you have some guidelines, like everyone has to stick to them. If someone, is, if someone doesn't agree with the guidelines, they can just like comment on the guidelines. And you can update them, of course. But have some guidelines. Have some sort of truth. Um, if there are no guidelines, write them. Uh, document everything. The usability, the API, the environment. Everything has to be documented. If you have an API that doesn't have documentation, document it. And by API, I don't only mean HTTP APIs. I mean like programmatic APIs too. If you have functions that are public that people are supposed to be using uh, when using your library or whatever, document those. If you have uh, everything, like the usability has to be documented, the environment, the way, the way you're supposed to be running this software or the way you recommend people to run this software. It's, um, it's kind of annoying when you have like a very complex software, uh, say, I don't know, like Kubernetes, just to pick a random one, and then you're supposed to run it yourself, and then you download it, and there's no good guidelines or documentation on how to run it. Like they say, yeah, you, it's easy to run. Like you just download Docker and you run Docker run, and it's all good. But then it's like, well, all right, that's that runs on my laptop. But what if I want to run it in production? What do I have to do? Like have some documentation about the environment, the expectations of the software, so that it's going to be way easier for your users to actually go out and adopt it and try it out. And all exist, yeah, of course, like all existing tests must pass. But again, like I said, some of the things sound obvious, but if you put them in the process, it's kind of like makes more sense. And if there are no tests, you should write them, of course. Yeah, you don't want to start modifying the code unless you have a source of truth. If you don't have a source of truth, don't touch the code yet. Build your guarantees first. Build your source of truth. Also, like running the software is going to teach you a lot, of the, a lot about the, the software that you're adopting. Writing the test is going to teach you a lot about the logic that was used to actually write the software. Right? If there are no tests, if you start writing the test, it's going to tell you a lot about the logic that the developer followed. And that's going to make it, make it easier to understand the rest of the software and the implementation specifically, not the usability part of it. Uh, the fourth step uh, is, is break down your strategy, small changes and focus changes. Uh, so. I'm a huge fan of small changes. And I'm, I don't mean like when I see a big review, I cry inside. I do cry inside, but I never tell it outside. But I'm a huge fan of, of small changes. The reason is because they're extremely focused and they allow you to move faster. Um, and, and they isolate the changes in a way that is easier to roll back most of the time. Um, so I'm a huge fan of, and by small changes, I don't mean like I change one line of code per commit, like no. but you, you, you isolate the kind of change that you want to do. If you have to rewrite an entire feature, I like to break the feature down into smaller changes that I can you know, progressively change and, and uh, so that I can get at the end you know, of the, the process I can, to, I can get to the, to the final feature that I want to write. And it's easier for review, of course, but it also makes it easier to write tests and to, to guarantee that you're not breaking other users. You can release smaller changes more often than doing a bunch of them in a, in a batch and, and release them as a big thing. Uh, so one small change at a time. Uh, well, this one is like focus on, on, on perfection. I'm sorry, it's focus on progress and not on perfection. Um, again, huge fan of small changes, but also a huge fan of progress. Like I don't, I don't like spending more than three days on a review that is like small. Um, if, if it's taking me more than three days to convince you that it is needed, we, it's, probably, it's probably because it is not needed or because you don't understand the actual review. Um, so focus on progress. Like you want to make changes that are not perfect but are allowing you to get to where you, got, you, you want to get. Right? And this, is not, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't be paying attention to technical debt or like, you know, things that eventually are going to create a huge backlog for you. But focus on getting where you want to get because progress will keep you motivated as well. If you don't make any progress, it's going to start becoming like extremely demotivating to work on the piece of software, and then you're probably going to stop doing it. So uh, perfection also, like perfection is overrated, I think, at least. I like progress better. It makes me feel better. Um, 
So, and don't change the, function, the functionality on error factor. So if you, imagine that you're not implementing a new thing, but you have a function in your code that is just poorly implemented and you want to refactor it. Do it, it's totally fine, but don't change the functionality. Just do the refactor, make it cleaner without changing what it is supposed to do. If the function is supposed to add two numbers, at the end of your refactor, it should still add two numbers. Then if you need to change the functionality, you will have a different process and a different commit and a different PR and a different whatever you want to call it to, to do that. And the reason is, is because if you mix refactoring with functionality changes, you are going to break users. You're going you're gonna to get to the end of this uh, root write process and you're going to have a mess. It, it's, harder to, it's harder to provide the guarantees when you do these two changes at the same time. And again, you're supposed to have guarantees at, the po at this point. So if you, if you refactor the code, you can expect the guarantees that you built to stay the same. If you refactor the code and change the functionality, you also have to update your guarantees. And you want to isolate those changes. You want to separate them as much as possible. And, and that's it. Right, the, the fifth uh, step is, is, well, you now have a new baby, and you got to repeat three and four as many times as possible. Um, until until you are fed up with it and you move on to your next job. Um, all right. As a final note, um, I'd like to advise you to to, oh, geez, uh, to don't take the shortest path. Um, take the longest one, or take the fastest one, even even though it feels longer. And, and an analogy I have for this is, is something that I read in a blog post. I didn't come up with this. Um, but if you want to go from CDA to CDB, it's the shortest path might be to go through downtown and you drive from CDA to CDB going through downtown. But that doesn't mean it is the fastest. It might most centrally be the slowest one because you got to go through downtown. There. There's traffic and traffic jams and all that and rush hour and whatever. Now, if you drive like 10 miles to the left to get a highway, and then you get the highway and hit the gas and drive down to CDB, you're going to get to CDB faster, although the road is longer than, than, the, than the previous option. Uh, what this wants to tell you is that doing all these things feels like a lot of work. It feels like it's going to take you forever to actually start changing the code. It feels like it's going to take you ages to get where you want. But once you have step one to four, I guess, um, nailed down, the iteration is going to be super fast. And eventually, once you have this baseline or the process set up for you, uh, doing your changes and keeping up with uh, all the requirements and everything is going to be way easier. Um, and again, like all these are suggestions that you should probably adapt to whatever works best for you. Uh, this is what worked for me in all the jobs that I have. And again, like I just changed like five months ago companies, and I was given another repo. I was like, well, this is the repo you have to maintain now. Go and learn it. And I was like, ah, oh, shit. Now I have to go through the entire process again. And I did. Um, and again, like in the long run, it's all going to pay off. It's all going to be easier for you. Uh, you just have to put up with it for, for a while as you, as you set up everything. Some highlights. Uh, understand the why, the why and the how first. Um, build your guarantees before changing the software. Focus on progress, not on perfection. That one is one of my favorite, honestly. Uh, know who the consumers are, extremely important. If you don't know who your consumers are and you have a project management team, go and kick their butts and get them to give you, you know, all this information because they have it and if they don't have it, they should have it. If you don't have a PM team, go and try to find it out yourself. Do questionnaires and like forums and everything online. Ping people, ping your users, get to know them, build your own community, and try to find out. Um, and document everything. Document everything, API, architecture, environment, docs, everything that you can document, document it. Um, even the company culture, if necessarily, honestly, so that whomever comes next at least doesn't have to go through the entire process from scratch. And that's pretty much it. I'll shut the fuck up now. Thank you. I think, uh, I think I nailed it. We have exactly five minutes for questions, and I have two extra socks to give away if someone asks me an interesting question. Well, a question. If it is interesting, I'm going to give you both. One question. Uh, 
It can be in Spanish, English, whatever you want. Hey, um, so I guess the most difficult part of this will be convincing management to, to take the time to build the requirements because you are probably going to be under a lot of pressure to get this done now. So any advice on that front? Uh, yes, ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> That is my best, seriously, that's one of the best advice I can give you right now. So management is going to say, you got to give it, you got to give everything to me in two weeks, right? So what I normally ask myself is, what can I give you that's going to keep you happy until I get there? So I'm going to give you as little as possible so that you stay happy and like I give you something and I can still go around and do all these things, right? It sounds like... Sounds sneaky, it is, but it's, it's, it's a way for me as a developer because we're talking like, he, manager is trying to do his or her job, which is totally fine, acceptable. I'm trying to do mine. And we gotta meet in the middle, we gotta meet somewhere. And if we're gonna just like keep giving management everything they want without doing the things that you know are important for you, then you're never gonna catch up. The backlog is just going to keep growing and growing and growing and growing. Management is never, on, it's never going to understand it because you're not putting enough priority to it. And you yourself are saying, like, yeah, whatever. Like, whatever you're saying is probably more important than what I have to do right now. And if you say to management, it's like, meh, no. I'm going to give you this because I know it is important. And I'm still going to do that because it's extremely important for our team. You might not understand it is important for our team. I do. That is my responsibility, right? Your team, and if it is not your team, you're part of the you're part of the team. So it's kind of like your team, anyways. You might not be leading it, but you're part of the team. So my team needs this thing, and it is extremely important. And if we want to grow as a company or as a team, we need to do this, right? So I'm gonna give you this bit to keep you happy and keep customers happy or whatever you gotta do. But you're still gonna work on the things that you're gonna do. And if they don't understand that, it's fine. Just keep doing whatever. Just do your stuff. I know it's hard, like it sounds like, I'm, it sounds like I'm coming from a very privileged place, but trust me, like when I say like, I've had these conversations with managers, and many times I was like, no, this is not happening. You go talk to the customers, PMs especially, because then most of the questions, most, most of these requirements come from PMs, and I'm like, no, just go talk to the customer. It's not happening. This release is gonna be back fixing. We're not, we're not doing any you know, new features. But we need to give quick features for customers. Well, all right, this is what we're gonna do. Like of all of the 20 features requests that you have, which one is the most important for you? That one is the one we're gonna do. The rest is gonna wait for the next release because we need to do this now. Also, you wanna suck, so. Hello. Uh, I have a case like you described it in my previous job, uh, but the thing is that everything went south when the manager at the time didn't quite know knew how to handle the request of the, the uh, from the client to also do uh, to, uh, not not just uh, redo the project from the own technology to re to re uh, reproduce exactly that. that like was working the system and on Ruby and Rails, but the client suddenly got excited when she, when she heard that our, the, our company was also doing uh, graphic design and user experience, and when she knew that during one of the work uh, on a work conversation, she asked for she asked for that to add to the project. The problem was that they never negotiation negotiated and. It, time extension because there was added work. The plan originally was to reproduce the old site as it was. Now we have to reproduce the old site and, and add, add the new redesign, which even if the, uh, the client knew it, included new functionality, especially in the front end area. Right. So how do you handle those type of requests that I'll the client, this say, you would tell the client, we have to reduce the, uh, the old site because it's crumbling, but we're going to do it like, like it is, even including box. But it suddenly got excited that, hey, can you add this, 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 and that? Yeah, I think, I think the, the answer to that question is very similar to the one that I just gave in the sense that, um, so uh, in this case, the, the customer not only wants the, the whole rewrite and, and having it like fully uh, functional as it is, but also wants like having a bunch of other features to it. And your management, apparently, doesn't know how to 
talk to the customer and convince the customer that it's not a good idea, right? So it's not, honestly, it's not your fault. It's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is talking to your manager and saying like that is not going to happen because if we do that, we're not going to provide a good service. Like you're gonna, you're gonna promise something that we cannot deliver, basically. And the one thing that as a I shouldn't say the one thing, but one of the things as a developer that I try extremely hard to not do is overpromise. Because when you overpromise and you underdeliver, you you're breaking your word. Like you're making people unhappy about the kind of things that you can do, right? And the one thing, especially as a company, that you don't want to do is overpromise to your customer and then underdeliver. It is better to say, hey, we're gonna focus on just rewriting for now and then magically add another feature and say like, hey, it turns out that we actually added the feature you want. Then saying, yes, we're gonna add everything on top of everything that we're doing and then get to the deadline and not being able to do neither A, neither a or B, right? So it's, not, it's really not your fault, it's your manager that has to, or PM that has to go to the customer and say like, I know you want the new feature, but if I give you the new feature now, in the long run, the software is gonna give you more problems, right? If we do that right now, we can promise you that the software is gonna be way more stable than it is now. It's gonna work way better than it works now, which is a great feature to have. Um, and then we're gonna add all the other features. So basically you need a better salesman. You need someone that can talk to the customer and sell this right in a better way, I guess. Yeah, so uh, since she was not uh, using the microphone, what she says is that they had a sales uh, person in the team that overpromised and no, not only overpromised but said that everything was gonna happen in five months and like promised it in uh, very little money. Uh, yeah, again, it's not your fault, really. What you can do is like stand still and speak up as a developer and saying like we cannot do that. Because then again, like you're not only gonna make the customer unhappy, you're gonna make yourself unhappy. And so what kind of work is that? Like you, you wanna be, you wanna deliver the best thing and do the best work that you can do, right? And in the best way possible, I guess. So. Uh, when is a rewrite necessary? Is there some kind of an indicator that shows up that's like, oh, we really obviously want to rewrite this? Or some kind of a cue that's. Yeah, so I have like. Somewhere here, here. So, I mean, besides these questions that I think are, are important, it's, it's mostly like, Putting all these things in a, in a in like in a in a balance and trying to see whether the rewrite is actually going to bring more benefits or not. Like to me, um, I very rarely, rarely, very rarely consider a rewrite unless it is really going to make uh, the operations part better. That to me uh, is is extremely important because if the current software as it is doesn't run, is not stable. Um, in production and it keeps breaking and it's pro it's cause it's generating more work for ops and time on calls and like fixing all these production problems than it is allowing us to build new features then the software probably needs a rewrite right um, or a good portion of it needs to be rewritten at least to make operations easier at language I know like the language and the environment I do consider it but I, like if the software works as it is there's also like I don't like to touch things that actually work because when you touch them, they normally break. Um, so if the software with the language that it is using right now and the frameworks, unless they're like extremely outdated, um, works well and it's easy to like maintain and like evolve, then I'm not gonna rewrite it just because it is, it is written in Ruby. Like I might just learn Ruby at that point. And I'm sorry I said that in a Python conference, but um, yeah, like it's, uh, I wouldn't use the language as an excuse. It is an excuse if you're the only developer in the team and you're still like, it's gonna take me five months to actually learn this environment, like this ecosystem and this language. And I know Python already, and I know I can do all this in a week, then just rewrite it, I guess. But for big software, I guess operations is the most important part to me. And I think we ran out of time, I'm sorry. Thanks everyone. <laughs>